What is going on everyone? Welcome to another episode here on the My Gardener channel. I am so excited for this one because I'm going to be answering a viewer question that's been coming up a lot, not just from one viewer, but many as to why we pick certain varieties to grow every single year. And this is a really good question that we do get a lot and I don't think I've really talked about it, but I call them MI Gardener regular varieties. These are MI Gardener approved garden, uh, kind of garden approved varieties, if you will. Uh, there's really no, I mean, there's no specific term that I've actually given them, but if I had to give them a term, it's kind of just MI Gardener garden approved varieties. Uh, and they're varieties that we can trust and they're varieties that we go to every single year. As you, uh, well, for those that have been watching this channel for a long time, you'll know that I do love to experiment. But as a tip to everyone, I only experiment with only 10% of our garden. I take my entire garden space, I take all the varieties that I'm going to grow, and I wanna make sure that I get in my guaranteed varieties first. And then what I do is I, t I allow about 10% of the garden to experiment with other varieties, whether it's a tomato, whether it's a zucchini or a cucumber or, or anything for that matter. I like to make sure that I do allow some room for that experimental crop because you never know if you're gonna find something you like even more than what you're already growing. But I think it's very important to have kind of go-to varieties, especially if you're growing for necessity. If you're growing for the fun of, and the love of things, this is not as important. And it's something that might not be uh, something that you're going to follow. But for someone like me who tries to put food on our, on our family's plate and, tr and relies on our garden to, to provide 100% of the fruit and vegetable needs that we consume uh, in a given year, it's very, very important to have production. And that's why that's kind of our first priority when we're looking at what varieties we're going to plant. It's varieties we love to eat, it's varieties that are tried and true, and it's varieties that we've grown in the past and found work very well for our area. So a prime example of this is one that I'm sitting by right now, and that is the opalca tomato. I grow opalca every single year because it is an extremely prolific, very, very disease resistant tomato that produces large paste tomatoes that we primarily use for making spaghetti sauce, pizza sauce, uh, tomato paste, and things like that. It's very low on gel, it's very low on seeds, but it's very, very meaty. And so it's very similar to aroma, only the fact that you get about, I mean, out of, out of a single tomato, you get about the equivalent of three or four aromas from one tomato. And they're just as productive, I've found, as aromas. They're just a little harder to find the seeds for, but we will be carrying them in the 2018 uh, MI Gardener seed store. So we'll be looking for them because they're ones that have been really difficult to source, but we finally found a reliable source and absolutely love the seeds that we're getting. So uh, this one right here is actually a cross uh, that I've been pointing to. I crossed that with a, uh, an Oxart tomato last year. That's kind of one that I've been working on, but um, the one on the other side, <laughs> the one on the other side is an Opalka. And either way, the Opalka varieties are still our go-to all-time favorite. Um, and and that's, just a, that's just a good example because you know we go through a lot of tomato paste, we go through a lot of spaghetti sauce, and I want something that I can guarantee I'm going to have the production to make the spaghetti sauce that we're going to need to last through the winter. So, I mean, just, and again, prime example is, is the Opalka. But another one is the, uh, is the Mortgage Lifter here. Mortgage Lifter, we love it because it produces large, meaty tomatoes that we can that we can rely on having uh, BLTs or club sandwiches or uh, just I mean tomato salad tomato cucumber salad with mozzarella it's just a very meaty very reliable delicious tomato for for anything that you're looking for in terms of beef steak I don't grow beef steak I don't grow uh, a lot of different you know beef steak varieties because I've already kind of picked out my beef steak that I love, and that's the Mortgage Lifter. So that's just another one of those ones where, uh, for instance, last year I grew Oxart, and that's what I crossed with the Opalka there to, to have an Opalka uh, Oxart cross. But notice I'm not growing the Oxart this year, and that's because I found them not to be very productive. I found them to be very uh, prone to disease. And also another thing too, is I take a lot of my recommendations from people in our area. So one of the things that I've found is that people having success in our area will give you recommendations. So, you know, hey, this variety does really well for us here, or this variety didn't do really well for us. I'll take those recommendations if I'm new to an area or I'm trying new varieties that I might not have tried before and someone might have tried them 
and knows more about them than I do. I think that's great for people to take home because that's really what gauges a lot of our, a lot of our um, you know, new varieties uh, that we explore with. Uh, and a very prime example of that is the golden zucchini. The golden zucchini was a variety we'd never tried before, but after talking with a zucchini farmer in the thumb of Michigan, relatively pretty close, about three hours away from us, but still pretty close nonetheless, I spoke with a zucchini farmer that had actually switched over most of his production to golden zucchini because he found that the golden zucchini outproduced the dark green zucchini three to one. It was more powdery mildew resistant, which is big around here because we have really humid, damp nights, uh, especially in late summer, and usually knocks them out very early. And so having something that's more resistant to powdery mildew is huge here. Not only that, but it's more productive and it tastes exactly the same as the green. So if you're growing zucchini, that's why we chose golden zucchini and we actually grow more golden zucchini than we do dark green. Now we do grow both. We do grow both because I love the green, but when you're looking at, again, just a reliable variety, golden zucchini is one that we, that we can trust every single year. And then it comes to things like kale, where they don't really, there's not really a reason why we pick a specific type of kale, primarily because there's not a whole lot of varieties of heirloom kale out there, and all the kale we found to be relatively very productive, and other than some flavor differences, that's why we grow a lot of different varieties of kale because we use different types of kale for different purposes. So we'll always pick these four types of kale and with the exception of the one that we found that we just don't like, it's still just as productive and that's the red Russian kale. This was the final year that we're growing that. We just don't like it. There's not a whole lot of uses for it. And it's, you know, it's good for juicing and things like that. It's good when it's small. If you're using it for baby Russian, red Russian kale um, in like a salad mix and things like that, it's not bad. But in terms of large, like getting it fully mature size like this here, you just can't go wrong with a blue curled scotch kale or a lacinato for juicing. We use this in salads. We use the lacinato in juicing and salads. And then we also use the Premier as a wrap for like vegetable wraps or for sp uh, like vegetable spring rolls or you can also use them um, in juicing. Making kale chips is really great because they have a lot of surface area. And then also the scarlet kale because it's so rich in antioxidants. That was actually one we experimented with last year, found we loved it. And again, that was one of those ones that you tried 10% of the, just 10% of the, the garden space that we usually dedicate towards kale. We dedicated 10% of that space to, re to uh, the scarlet kale. Found it, we absolutely loved it. It grew great. It grew just as awesome as the other ones. It was just, it was just an incredible deep purple color. And it was something that we'd never seen before. Loved the flavor of, and it's something that we integrate with juicing, salads and things like that. And so you have those varieties where uh, it doesn't really matter what you pick, you're going to have success with it. Very similar example is with lettuce or very similar example is with, uh, is with cabbage and things like that. Um, no matter what you plant, it's going to do very well. And that's where you kind of get into your tried and true heirloom varieties where you can experiment with just about anything and you're going to guarantee get something. And we've kind of picked out our favorites, obviously for our, uh, for our intended purpose, but that gets really personal. For instance, the Wakefield giant cabbage or the Copenhagen market cabbage or the, uh, or the red acre cabbage. Those are three cabbages we grow every single year because they're consistently large size heads of cabbage. They are early to form heads so that they're kind of beating out all the, the pests and the bugs that come later in the season. So they're early to forming heads. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're useful in any type of cooking that we're doing, just like any other cabbage would be, but because we need a cabbage that's early and we need a cabbage that forms nice, perfectly round heads so it's efficient on space. Those are just ones that we chose. But again, that's why we chose those varieties. And it will always vary for all of you, the varieties that you choose, because it's gardening is not a one size fits all uh, solution. I can tell you all the varieties that grow great for us, but they are not the varieties, or they might not be the varieties that are going to grow great for you. Some varieties are just great pretty much anywhere. And those, a lot of those are your heirloom tried and true varieties, your market friendly varieties, things like Scarlet Nance carrots or uh, market more cucumbers, um, things like that, that are just, they're the varieties that 
pretty much anywhere, anyone anywhere can grow and, and have really reliable success. And that's what I love about market friendly varieties, which we've talked a lot about um, in, in growing because they're consistent and they're reliable. And even a beginning gardener can, gr can grab a pack of seeds, throw them in the ground and have just as much success as anybody else, regardless of where they live. And I love that about the market friendly varieties. But um, in terms of the you know, unique heirloom varieties and things like that, that really comes down to experience. You just have to try growing it. You have to learn um, you know, how to grow things, how to grow them correctly. And when you do grow them correctly, at, at kind of at some point you say, okay, this one just is not growing for me. And I think that comes with uh, experience and time and also growing a, a wide variety of things. If you only grow one tomato a year, you don't know if it was the growing conditions that were bad or if it was the variety that was bad. So I always recommend as well, we, a lot of people ask, you know, Luke, why on earth do you grow 24 varieties of tomatoes in one location? There's no way on planet earth you use all those. Well, we don't, we give a lot away, we sell some, we, we can some, freeze some. I mean, we, there's, there's just so many tomatoes. But the biggest thing for me is that I love learning from my experiences. And I've found that if I grow 24, uh, 24 plants or 12 varieties, two of each variety, uh, making 24 plants, I'll be able to find out not only the varieties that are that are doing poorly, but I'll be able to better gauge if it was just the growing season that was poor because you do have that where you have a bad growing season and regardless of what you choose, it just does poorly. So I hope that helped. I hope you all enjoyed this episode and I, I really do hope that I made it concise as to why we pick the varieties that we choose. Um, and also what I'll do is in the description box below, just as a, as a treat, I'll post all of the varieties that we consistently grow every single year without fail. Um, it's gonna be a long list but it's going to give you an idea of the varieties we choose so that you can pick from that list and, and maybe give some a try and just note and please do note that not everything I choose is going to grow great for you it's just an inherent risk of climate you know uh, climate differences or soil differences and even even your own personal preference um, it might not it might not meet your needs so just know that going into it but it's going to give you a really good uh, really good guide is some some ones that we absolutely love so I hope you all enjoyed hopefully you learned something new and as always this is Luke from the MI Gardener channel reminding you to grow big or go home we'll catch you all later see ya bye